Hi, welcome back to General Chemistry 2. My name is Chuck White, and today's lesson is on complex reaction mechanisms. We're going to talk about kinetics, or the rates of reactions, and we'll talk about how to predict the rate law for a chemical reaction for, our, for various types of mechanisms shown here. And at the end, we'll talk about catalysis and three different types of catalytic mechanisms. Now the first and easiest situation to deal with is one where you have a multi-step reaction and uh, the first step is slow compared with all of the other steps that come after it. Here it's a rate determining step and uh, the, the rate of the overall reaction is given by the molecular, molecularity of the slow step. So in this simple example the rate would be first order in reactant A. So let's consider an example of this, um, the reaction of NO2 with CO to produce NO plus CO2. This actually goes by a two-step mechanism, and although looking at the overall reaction, you might assume that it's first order in NO2 and first order in CO, the slow step is actually uh, second order in NO2, and that controls the overall kinetics. And so the overall reaction rate is actually independent of the carbon monoxide concentration, as long as some reasonable amount is present to make the second reaction fast. The second uh, situation arises when uh, one of the reactions is slow, but some of the first steps are fast. And, a, and an example is the reaction of H2 with I2 to form HI. Here, the overall rate law of the reaction derived from experiments is first order in H2 and first order in I2. So you might think that this reaction occurs by a single elementary step, but it turns out that detailed experiments show that um, iodine atom radicals are involved, and so it's actually a more complicated mechanism. And if we write this as a three-step mechanism where the first two steps are fast and the third one is slow, we can write the first two steps as reversible reactions where the, where the rate of the forward reaction and the reverse reaction for each step is fast enough to maintain an equilibrium concentration. So we can write equilibrium constants for each of these uh, two first first two reactions, and we can write the overall rate of the reaction as the production rate of HI, uh, and we need a factor of 2 here for the stoichiometry. And that would be the rate of the third step, which is K3 times the H2I concentration times the iodine atom concentration. But those are all radicals, and we don't know really how to measure their concentrations quantitatively. But we can take the equilibrium expressions for the first two reactions and substitute in for H2I at first, and then secondly for the I atom concentration, and finally end up with an expression where we have a bunch of constants times the H2 concentration times the I2 concentration. So this rate law can be first order in H2 and first order in I2, second order overall, and still be consistent with a three-step mechanism instead of just a single-step reaction. Now one of the things that's very useful for predicting overall rates for complicated reactions is the steady state approximation. And this is where we assume that the steady, the concentration of chemical intermediates, typically short-lived intermediates, is constant. And now that's actually never the case, but if the concentrations are small, then the errors made by this approximation are also small. So let's see how this works for a case of a unimolecular reaction. Cyclobutane, C4H8, uh, if you just simply heat it up, uh, will decompose to ethylene. And it does this by uh, a series of uh, one step, which is reversible, and then a second step, which is irreversible. And if we consider the energized molecule, C4H8 star in this case, uh, to be a chemical intermediate uh, that's capable of undergoing this reaction to, C to uh, ethylene, then we can write the rate of formation, uh, or the time rate of change, of the activated molecule uh, to be zero. This is the steady state approximation. And that's equal to the sum of three different rates. One rate of formation, which is K1 times the uh, cyclobutane concentration times the concentration of M, which represents any molecule in the system. It could be cyclobutane, or a buffer gas, or even product. Um, minus the rate of its destruction, which occurs by the reverse of reaction 1, and also by reaction 2. And you notice that any time cyclobutane activated molecule is being destroyed, we have a negative sign, but when it's being produced, we have a positive sign on that term. And then we can solve this equation for the steady state concentration of the activated molecule. 
we write the overall reaction as uh, the change in ethylene concentration, which would be uh, K2 times the activated molecule concentration. And uh, so that will be uh, this complicated expression. Now, at high pressure, uh, in, if we look at the denominator of this expression, the one that scales with pressure is going to be large and the K2 term is going to be relatively small. So if we ignore the K2, then the M's cancel and we can write this as a simple expression, which is actually uh, predicting first order kinetics in cyclobutane concentration. And at low pressure, K2 actually becomes more important, and so the apparent rate constant will fall off. And in this fall-off region, uh, the kinetics, the overall kinetics, adopt more of a pressure dependence that's like second-order kinetics in uh, cyclobutane rather than first-order kinetics. Now, free radical chain reactions are really important, especially in explosions. And uh, usually this involves three types of steps. An initiation step, which creates the free radicals. A propagation step, which cycles mu many uh, or large concentrations of reactants to products using a relatively small concentration of free radicals. And then termination steps, which re result in the destruction of the free radical intermediates. Now, an example is the reaction of methane with fluorine, which um, in an initial collision, an initiation, produces methyl radicals and fluorine atoms. The methyl radicals can react with F2 to form CH3F and generate a fluorine atom. The fluorine atoms then react with methane to form HF plus methyl radicals. So the product, the free radical product of one reaction in the propagation steps is the reactant in the other, and it in turn uh, reproduces the methyl radicals, which are the reactant in the first step. Now rate laws for these complications uh, these complex reactions are most often solved by numerical integration of sets of differential equations. It's just a plug and chug in the computer. Uh, but sometimes we're able to farm uh, closed form solutions for free radical reactions, and they, they're often characterized by concentrations of stable species to the one half or three halves power. Now let's talk about catalysis. All catalysts work by creating low energy pathways for reactants to be converted to products without you actually using up the catalyst itself. Uh, so we know that most chemical reaction barriers uh, are due to at least the partial bond breaking that's associated with chemical reactions. And so catalysts help to lower the barriers to those bond breaking processes. And homogeneous catalysts, uh, all the catalysis occurs in a single phase, for, the, for example, the gas or liquid phase. And a case of gas phase reaction is the destruction of ozone in the stratosphere by chlorine atoms, which typically come from uh, chlorofluorocarbons. And you can see we have a cycle of reaction that results in the net destruction of ozone, but uh, the recycling of chlorine atoms. And so chlorine atoms act as the catalyst in this case. Heterogeneous catalysis uh, is one which uh, takes place at the interface between two phases, either liquid solid or um, gas solid, and uh, less typically uh, a gas-liquid interface. And so uh, an example is your, the catalytic converter in your car, which uh, is designed to um, oxidize CO to CO2, uh, to, to convert nitrogen oxides, uh, the result from combustion, uh, into oxygen and nitrogen, and to take any unburn, unburned hydrocarbons from the gasoline and convert them into CO2 and H2O by reaction with oxygen. Now the third type of catalysis uh, it occurs for biological systems, and enzymes are proteins that help to catalyze certain chemical reactions in the body, frequently oxidation of uh, various species. And uh, there's a Michaelis-Menten uh, mechanism for enzyme reactions, which basically starts with the binding of an enzyme with a substrate or some, some sort of reactant molecule that's in your body to form an intermediate complex, which we label ES here. The uh, ES can either just fall apart in a reversible uh, reaction to form the enzyme and substrate again, or it can react again um, unimolecularly to form uh, the enzyme, which is a catalyst and re is regenerated, and some sort of reaction product. Uh, now, very similar to the unimolecular reaction case, we can use the steady state approximation to solve this uh, set of reactions to get the Michaelis-Menten constants, the maximum velocity of reaction, 
function and the uh, Michaelis constant, Km, and uh, at uh, very high concentrations of substrate, this will saturate when all of the enzyme is tied up as the ES complex. Um, as you reduce the substrate concentration, you'll get this falloff region, much as we saw from uh, unimolecular reactions. And when you get to um, half the saturation rate, uh, then the substrate concentration at that point is equal to the Michaelis constant. So this is a pretty easy uh, situation to solve. Next time we will talk about nuclear reactions, we'll talk about radioactive decay of unstable isotopes, and we'll talk about where nuclear energy comes from in fission reactions and fusion reactions. See you then.